1995, African American civil rights activists planned the Million Man March on Washington, D.C. to unite the black community against social and economic ills. One of the organizers of the march was the Reverend Louis Farrakhan, who made numerous homophobic statements on record. Keith Boykin, who was at the time the executive director of the National Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum, recounted to In the Life how black gay men stood proud in response. The National Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum a Board of Directors met in September of 1995 to discuss the issue of the Million Man March. At that time, there was some concern about whether we wanted to encourage our members or other black lesbians and gay men to participate. After very serious and careful discussion and debate, we decided that we would encourage people to participate, but only if they were to do so openly and visibly about who they were, not to hide a part of their identity or not to be ashamed of who they were. And certainly there to be ready to challenge any sort of homophobia that might come up or any sort of instances of sexism that we felt were of concern. So it was important that we participate and we participate on our own terms. After that decision was made, we organized a series of activities around the march, uh, cultural, social, political activities, including our own rally. And we marched into the, um, onto the mall where the event occurred and we were warmly received, very enthusiastic, positive responses. I, I felt all along the march route, the, uh, the throng of black men who lined the streets and who were in the streets parted like the Red Sea when we came through chanting gay men of African descent. I mean, it was just a wonderful, powerful, motivating, moving, inspiring experience for me, and I think for all the people who were there. I think what we learned from this experience, though, was that when we come out and when we are not ashamed about who we are as black gay men and lesbians, that our community, the black community, not only, uh, they not only accept us, they respect us more. Before the Stonewall Rebellion, there was a group of ordinary citizens taking a stand and picketing for gay rights in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. In the Life remembers the pioneering work started by Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings. This is the front of the famous Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and this is where we had gay picketing demonstrations every July 4 from 1965 through 1969. People think of the Stonewall Rebellion as uh, uh, the start of the gay civil rights movement. That's a myth. There was a movement starting back in the late 1940s and it gradually evolved and it picked up steam and we were doing this very revolutionary picketing in the 1960s before Stonewall ever happened. These are, these are stacks of various gay-related uh, picketing signs from a variety of demonstrations in Washington and also Philadelphia. In the middle 60s, um, activism and expressions of dissent hadn't uh, reached the levels that they did by the latter 60s and picketing in some such places as the front of the White House was the extreme expression of dissent par excellence. Things hadn't gone beyond that yet. There had been a big debate within the gay movement about whether or not we should have public demonstrations. And a lot of it was based on the fear we thought, boy, if somebody knew you were gay, they'd stone you to death or you know, attack you. you know, we didn't dare walk holding a sign saying that we were homosexuals. See, in those days, people thought it was very much smarter to uh, pass and uh, that people who didn't want to pass were just inviting trouble. Nobody was out then. I was probably, certainly for example, in my group down here, I was the only person who used my own name. Those early pickets 
were scary. It was scary because there were so few of us who could take the risk of being so public. For example, um, what if my boss sees me on the six o'clock news and fires me? Or what if my picture appears on the front page of my parents' hometown newspaper and causes grief or shockwaves in the town? And uh, what if some bystander starts throwing insults at us or worse, bricks or stones? Uh, and what is the government going to do with all those photographs and tape recordings that they're taking of us? We had a dress code. And it's easy now to look back 35 years later and uh, laugh at it and make fun of it because it was a very strict code. But I think it was appropriate for the time and I strongly supported it at the time. And I think it was right then because we were trying to get across a very unpopular message. We didn't want people to gawk at us. We wanted them to gawk at the messages on our signs in, and in our leaflets. Well, the philosophy um, was to make us look normal the way everybody else looked. So did we succeeded so well that, uh, as Frank Kameny said, um, some people thought we were actors. I remember specifically when we picketed in front of the Civil Service Commission, my, uh, um, my approach was, they, we want them to employ us. Therefore, within the normal mode of the day, uh, we have to give the appearance of being employable. We were representing, we felt, all those hundreds of thousands or millions of other Americans that were homosexual. This is independence. National what we saw it was a, a chance to remind uh, Americans on July 4th that we were equal citizens. And uh, what better place to do that than in front of the Liberty Bell? Independence Hall is where the thing was done. Both the uh, Declaration of Independence um, and uh, the Constitution were right there. It was right after the parade, the July 4th parade, and the, uh, the folding chairs were stacked up still and, then, and everything had been dismantled, the bleachers. And so then we came on and, and picketed. And I just felt a sense of, of uh, commitment and a sense of uh, passionate involvement. You know, it didn't bother me if people were negative, and there was a surprising lack of negativity there on the part of bystanders. I think they, they were surprised, but they didn't give us any trouble that I recall. There was a photographer there who told me that all I needed was a good man, you know. Just, or perhaps he even said that all I needed to do was sleep with the man. And, and I, I said something like I didn't need that or something and I, I just filmed, you know, and he stuck out his tongue at me. Otherwise, uh, it went off fine, and then uh, at the end, uh, um, on a signal, everybody, uh, we had, you know, signs on sticks, and everybody, flipped down their signs, the demonstration was over. Once the flag lowering music that was from the loudspeaker uh, started and we saw the flag lowering, we all stood and uh, put our right hand over our heart just to show that we were uh, good patriots and we respected the flag. You know, we were first class American citizens and we have wanted, that's a message we have wanted, we had wanted to tell everyone from the beginning. We're first class citizens. We are not marginal people. I feel that those demonstrations led directly into Stonewall in 69, and that without our demonstrations starting in 65, Stonewall would not have happened. Because what they did was to create the mindset for gay people who had never ever before done this to demonstrate publicly, to dissent publicly, to, to do things out in the open. And no, nobody had ever done this before. The 1969 demonstration took place just about a week after the Stonewall Rebellion in New York City. A lot of people who were fired up by the 
fight against the police at Stonewall came down to Philadelphia or came from other cities into Philadelphia and joined the demonstration and it was the largest we had ever had. There were about 150 people. That sounds like very little today, but for us it was a huge turnout. Here we saw uh, men in blue jeans, t-shirts, we saw a mixture, and it's that, like the transition from the old to the new. All of this, it, it was sort of a movement pulling itself up by its bootstraps. If you want to pursue the metaphor, we created the bootstraps, and then other people pulled and pulled and pulled, and up it went. And uh, pretty soon you have um, marches on Washington with hundreds of thousands of people. You know, coming out in a picket line in 1965 was downright revolutionary for that time. It took gumption. It really took gumption and the conviction that we were right and the world was wrong. We were just at the start of cracking that cocoon of invisibility. <laughs> 